So let's review this problem. Okay, so what we have a setup here, whereas they want to know the number of grams of aluminum that's going to be made, produced, okay, in an electrolysis apparatus that runs an hour uh, using molten or melted aluminum chloride, which is a salt melted so that the ions are free, and that the amperage in our electrolysis is 10 amps. So before I can get to the math, I want to make sure we definitely understand the setup here. So I definitely draw, I draw myself the battery, and I see that my anode is negative, my cathode's positive. It's connected to an electrode. These electrodes are probably going to be made out of some form of uh, material that doesn't oxidize or, um, so easily. Uh, we can assume that they're uh, platinum, although they won't always be platinum. Okay, but they're not going to be part of the experiment. They're just basically a conductor like the wire is. And we know the anode is going to pump electrons, okay, to this um, uh, electrode here. And the electrons kind of build up a little bit. And it's going to give it its negative charge because electrons flow from the anode of the battery to the cathode of the electrolytic cell. And that's true of any electrochemical cell, whether it's voltaic or electrolytic. Anode to the cathode, from the source of electrons to the what? where they're going, and cathode likes to pull them. All right, so, and we notice red cat is still true here. Reduction occurs the cathode. So the aluminum plus three ion is gonna be attracted, that's free because it's a liquid, okay? It's now melted or it's moved out of its crystal lattice position, and now the aluminum plus three can now move toward the negative cathode of the electrolytic cell and get reduced. Notice the electrons here come from the anode of the battery. So the anode of the battery forces, okay, aluminum plus three to reduce, and that is non-spontaneous. Aluminum plus three does not like to reduce. So the anode is forcing its hand by forcing its electrons onto the aluminum plus three. And we can look at a reduction table to see that as well. Okay, uh, any case, we know that the other side, of the batteries, the cathode, it's positive, and electrons get pulled by the cathode's ability to um, uh, form, uh, form an oxidizing agent, pull electrons away from this source here. We call this the anode because it's the place of oxidation. It's connected to the, guess what, the cathode. Now, because the positive um, terminal, the battery or electrode is positive and connected to this metal, it makes it positive. These signs are always the same. Okay, and of course, why is it positive? Yeah, because it's connected to the cathode, but more importantly, if electrons are flowing toward the cathode, there's a lack of electrons, and a lack of electrons makes this more positive, so the negative ions will move toward it, and they themselves get oxidized. They release the electron. Electrons are produced, and the negative one becomes zero. The charge gets um, basically increased, which is oxidation, but the two Cl negative ions give up two electrons, and what results is chlorine gas. All right, and that's what happened, fizzing here of chlorine gas. But the overall view here in electrolysis, normally we're purifying the ions into elements. So we took a salt, aluminum chloride, and we made the pure form of aluminum ions into the element aluminum. And we took the chlorine ion and we purified it into the pure form of the element chlorine gas. All right. And of course, very non spontaneous processes here because chlorine negative is never going to want to lose its two electrons to become chlorine gas. And the reason why chlorine is stable, if you know, chlorine is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p5. So when you have the chlorine ion, it's three, uh, chlorine is 3P5. With the negative electron, it's 3P6. This is a filled oxidation state. So this is very stable. We're trying to make it go unstable as chlorine gas. Chlorine is pretty reactive because they have the seven valence electrons. So this is what I'm talking about here. So they're creating unstable results. Aluminum loves to oxidize. It hates to reduce. So both of these processes are non-spontaneous in nature and we can see them because they both when in reduction and in oxidation are both negative the re, uh, the e0 of cell even though I'm not asking here would be negative 
to show that it's a non-spontaneous process. It's important that you understand. There's no salt bridge here. And the battery, if you switch the leads, you would switch who the anode and cathode is, just like the experiment we did in class. So in any case, those are the basics, and I hope you can see that. Now let's get back to the question at hand. Okay, let's get to where it, really, where it says. It wants to know how many grams of the aluminum that you're purifying from the ion stage to the pure element state. How much of aluminum are we going to make if I run this experiment for an hour and there's 10 amps of current being pushed around? So let's go to what the math would look like here. Now before we get going, we have to understand what amps are, okay? We understood and we had a discussion with voltages. Voltage is a electromotor force that pushes the current around. So an amperage, okay, is, so we have 10.0 amps. Amperage is equal to the actual current, the current of, the, it's, it's the actual amount of charge. So it's important you understand that. It's the amount of charge. You can think of it as the amount of electrons in this case. Many people have different ways of expressing current. But, so current is the actual amount of charge that passes through the conductor over a time period. All right, so larger the amperage, the more flow of current, the more electrons are flowing, if you want to go that route. Voltage, okay, is the force that pushes the current. I keep going back to my analogy. If I have a waterfall, this is where the water is running. Let's make it color-coordinated. If the waterfall is here and is a long drop-off, Okay, the higher the waterfall here, the more force that the water hits, or the greater the difference in height, okay, the better this waterfall is going to have a force at the bottom. So you can think of the potential to have a tremendous amount of force of water at this point occurs the higher the waterfall. And the potential in waterfall, it's more like the potential difference of charge. So we call this electromotor force. We call it the potential difference in high amounts of electrons or charge to low amounts, if you want to think of it that way. But the actual amount of water that flows is the actual current. The force that pushes it is the voltage, which is a great indicator of spontaneity for us. Okay, so what is amperage? Well, in your reference table, there's a formula. Let's go there. So on the last page where you see oxidation reduction electrochemistry section, you'll see I equals Q over T. And I is a fancy word for amperage. Even though they don't use A, uh, you'll see V equals IR and a bunch of other different uh, formulas used in, in uh, physics. And I is representative of amperes or amperage. Okay, Amps is the unit, but uh, the symbol for current is I. Q, as we've seen before in Coulomb's law, is charge, and um, so this is going to be Coulomb's, the number of charge. So it's a Coulomb is a value of, or a unit of charge, and T is time that it normally is in second. So let's go back to where we were. So what we have here is I, which is really our amperage, is equal to the charge over some time period. So this becomes amperage, which is equal to coulombs, that's the unit of charge, the SI unit of charge, which is the charge of, or you can think of it, the amount of charge of electrons. There's, electrons have some amount of coulombs associated with them. So if we measure the total amount of coulombs, uh, we're really measuring the total amount of electrons passing through, and over a time period of seconds. So really, amperage is the amount of coulombs, unit of charge, per second. So in the problem, they wanted to know how many grams of lead is going to, I'm sorry, of um, aluminum, pure aluminum, is going to plate and become pure aluminum at this electrode. How much is, it how much is going to happen, or how much grams is going to plate on this electrode, the cathode here? So what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to figure out how many total amount of coulombs have occurred. So if we know that there is 10 coulombs of charge per second, and this ran for one hour, 
Can we figure out the total amounts of coulombs? Absolutely. Now I'm going to do it by dimensional analysis. Okay, you can do it any way you'd like. All right, so let's get a little bit bigger. Okay, so let me do this by dimensional analysis. All right, so I'm going to take my 10.0 coulombs per second. And I'm going to try to convert this to coulombs per hour. Okay, some of you guys can do this in your head, but I think it's really, really uh, beneficial to learn how to use your units and keep things simplified and not multiplying multiple times. Anytime you have to multiply multiple times in a multiple multiple step problem, I said that too many times, you're going to make mistakes. So I'm going to get rid of seconds. So I'm going to put seconds up here. I know they'll cancel. Okay, so what do I know? Well, I do know there is 60 seconds in one minute. That's a converting factor. Okay, you did this last year or this summer. Seconds go bye-bye. So if I times it by 60, I get coulombs per minute. But I want per hour. So I'm going to get rid of minute. Same idea, one minute on top. Or I'll just put minute on top, and I want one hour. Uh, so it's actually going to be not one minute, one per hour. There's actually, what, 60 minutes per one hour. And we can cancel our hearts away, the minutes go bye-bye, and this whole expression is total amount of coulombs per hour. You can take 10 times 60 times 60 and write it down. That's an easy one to remember, but if you use your units, you can cancel this out. So I've got total amount of coulombs. Now, we're going to take the total amount of coulombs that we get per hour, and now we're going to kind of make a leap here. We need a new way to go from total charge. Remember, this represents the charge due to the flow, let's say, of electrons. Okay? Now, what we found years after the first electrolysis like, experiments, when we had the mole concept, we found that a mole of electrons has a certain amount of charge. So since we're measuring total charge, let's go find out, or let's try to convert this total charge into how many electrons pass through. So the converting factor to take how much charge is passed through the wire or the current to actually how many electrons is that we need a converting factor. What is the total amount of charge per one electron or what's the total amount of charge per a mole of electrons? And that's called Faraday's constant. Okay, Michael Faraday was very important in um, solidifying all of our electromagnetic formulas. He actually solidified uh, magnetic forces and electrical forces as one and the same laws. In fact, Einstein had a picture of Michael Faraday with him in his office because of the unification that he did. But um, he did not discover a mole, nor did he come up with this constant, but they give it in, uh, uh, for his work in, uh, again, magnetism and electricity unifying. So Faraday's constant is what they found to be uh, the charge of one mole of electrons. So let's go to our reference table because you don't have to have it memorized. So there it is. Fancy F. There's 96,500 coulombs of charge per mole of electrons. You say, why do we need that? Because I can convert charge into how many electrons? And you still might say, well, why is that important? Well, let's see. Okay, so Faraday's constant is a way for us to go from charge to the number of electrons. So I want to get into the actual number of electrons. See, the mole represents a number. So this gives me a link to do stoichiometry. And I'll explain in a second. So let's convert our coulombs into total number of electrons. So coulombs on top, I want to get rid of coulombs. They go on bottom. And I want, okay, mole of electrons. E negative. And the number is... 96,500. Now, you missed the Grotsky. Faraday's constant is coulombs over mole of electrons. How come you flipped it? I can do that. It's a ratio, and I can write it any way I like. In this case, I want to get rid of coulombs. Since they're started up top, I want to get there. So all of this is going to tell me total charge, right in blue. Timesing it by Faraday's constant converts my charge into a how many number. Mole is a how many. That's important. Now I know 
that I have some number of electrons. Okay, so this gives me some number of electrons. Why is that important? Let's go to the half reaction. What do I have? For every what? Three electrons, there's one aluminum plus three that makes what? One aluminum. So for every one aluminum atom that's made, three electrons are necessary. See, having the total charge and Faraday's constant, we're able to figure out the what? The total number of electrons that passed through the wire. And that I can use my stoichiometric ratios to get how much aluminum. It's a three to one ratio, right? There's three electrons for every one aluminum made. So if you think this through, if whatever this comes out to be mathematically, doesn't it make sense a third of it is how many aluminum atoms are made? If you don't see that, look up here, party people. Aluminum that's made, there's one of these per three of these. If I have the total amount of electrons, and a mole represents how many of them I have, then I have, have to have a third of them to get moles of aluminum. And now I'm coming up with how much aluminum atoms I have, and I'm closer to my answer. So the next step, using my units. Okay, let's do the ratio. Let's times it by the ratio. Now this becomes stoichiometry. For my institute kids or my students from previous, camp, uh, uh, previous classes, stoichiometry is when you use a ratio of one chemical or substance to another. All right. So we know that there's three electrons for every one aluminum made. I'm getting that ratio from my half reaction. Okay. You need to understand that. And I'm going from what? electrons directly into aluminum. See, stoichiometry is when you go from one chemical species to another, all right, by using the ratios. So now look what's going to cancel party people and people that want to go to the party. I'm going to get rid of electrons and I get rid of electrons. So what do I have? Moles of aluminum. So I actually have the number of aluminum atoms. What did the question ask for? The question asked for not how many atoms, but what the what? what the mass of the atoms are. Well, we know by the mole concept, to go from moles of atoms to grams, I'm timesing by the uh, gram atomic mass, okay? And again, we're learning this historically, so this would be a little later that we figure this out, but I wanna go over it now. So, moles on top, right? I get use my units, dimensional analysis, I put one mole in the bottom. And one mole of aluminum is equal to, well, how many grams? So I go to the periodic table. So we're at the periodic table of elements, and we look up aluminum, and we see that it's a mass, or its atomic mass is 26.98. Remember, that's a reason you have that there, is because of the um, average abundances of all the isotopes. And that happens also to be the grams per one mole. Why? Because we made it that way. Okay, that's, remember, we chose 22.4 liters volume because that's exactly the mass that these guys give us in their atom in their gram atomic masses. So we made this mass equal to one mole. So the gram atomic mass is 26.98. We can round off to 27. And 27 goes here. And now we notice the moles cancel. And the only unit left standing is the what? Grams over hour. So this tells me the grams of what? Aluminum per hour that's made. Okay. And again, really nice to set this up. Use your units so that you're just doing one calculation. So take my calculator out or my later of calc and I'll take my 10 and I'm timesing it by 60. I'm timesing it by 60 again. Okay. I'm dividing by 96,500. Uh, I'm dividing by 3 to get the ratio of aluminum, and I'm timesing by 27, and this is going to give me the grams per that number of moles. So we get 3.357 because we started this process, okay, with three significant figures, we'll end up with 3. So this is 3.3. .3 and we'll say six 
okay? And it's grams of aluminum per hour that's made, okay? And that's your answer. So it's kind of a cool thing um, to be able to, again, link how many electrons actually transpired or gone through a, 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 um, a conductor from the current value and then converting to total charge into total number of electrons, knowing the ratio of the electrons to the product in our half reaction, and then using the formula mass to convert the moles of this into grams. All right, and that's how we do that problem. And the other problems in the worksheet are very similar using the same concepts. 